morning. This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50, on page number 845 in the Bibles on your chair. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Hey, real quick before we get started, um, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Stephen for preaching in my absence last week. I listened, he did an awesome job. You guys are privileged to have uh, pastors in this church like Stephen and Chris and others that can bring the Word of God to you. And so will you help me say thank you to Stephen for, for last week? Thanks, buddy. Uh, the, the other thing, r- real quickly, I, this, this service just traditionally tends to be our fullest service, and if some of you are like, gosh, I wish it wasn't so full and you'd like some more room, um, uh, we'd love to see you either go to 9 o'clock or even move to Saturday night. In fact, we'd, we'd really kind of need uh, some of you core people uh, that want to think missionally uh, to move to Saturday night and help us free up some room on Sunday morning. So if you'd prayerfully consider that, uh, that would help us free up space in here where most of our visitors come, uh, and we'd be kind of helping to continue advance and grow. Um, because uh, we're going to run into some space issues here pretty soon, and, uh, and and if you could help us with that, that that would be great. Hey, listen, um, I, I feel like we just need to stop and and pray before I get started this morning, Father. Uh, we just pause here because we have to talk about some things that, without the power of your Holy Spirit, um, they will fall on deaf ears, they will fall on hardened hearts, and so I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we deal with some hard things, God, give us. Uh, give us grace, the grace of hearing. Uh, touch me, Lord. I, I, I feel inadequate to the task this morning, and so I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, and most of all, that your word would be made clear. This isn't about me. This is about your word and, and it coming to our ears and transforming us. So we pray, come by your power and heal us and touch us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, Paul says this. He says, note well then the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his his kindness. So Paul commands us in Romans chapter 11 to, to note well. That word means to look into, to study, to meditate on, to to you know note the, this the kindness of God but also his severity now let's face it we love talking and thinking and meditating on the kindness of God and we should and we do I mean this whole book of Mark is filled with the kindness of God in Christ but Paul says we have to be careful to look into God's severity And we don't like that as much. And the problem, see, the problem is failing to look at the severity of God is not only disobedient, but it is dangerous and ultimately very unloving. If I got a little two-year-old and I have a pool at home and I say to him, hey, buddy, um, come on and let's splash in the pool and this pool is great. It's going to have just endless summer fun. You're going to have a great time. It's going to bring you so much joy. But I don't also take time to teach that kid that if you're not careful and you're not here with daddy, this thing will kill you. So this thing that can cause you so much joy can also kill you. Jesus, so, so Paul says, note the kindness, that's great, but note the severity. So listen, um, any teacher that fails to unpack the severity of God for you is ultimately not loving you. Don't, don't, Don't make the mistake of saying, all I want to hear is somebody that will itch my ears and make me feel good about myself when I leave here. That should happen, right? You shouldn't just be beat up all the time. 
Sometimes we need to hear, we need to hear some severe things, some hard things. I'm like, and I'm preaching this message today, and I, I, I think it's going to be pretty obvious by the end of this that um, this is not a church growth sermon, okay? I wanted to grow the church. I'd talk about sex. I'd talk about something else that would be like, ah, let's go hear that, right? I doubt anybody got up this morning and said, man, I hope he talks about sin and hell today. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> um, but I have to talk about it because Jesus talks about it. So all I want to do, I want to just tell you two things, okay, with some sub points and I know you're like, wow, two things, it's going to last 50 minutes, but here we go, okay? So first thing is this, sin is serious. This is what Jesus is saying in this passage. In Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 50, he's telling us sin is very, very serious. It's no small matter. The degree of sin is in direct proportion to the one sinned against. Okay, now, now, now think about that because most of us, when we think of sin, we think about it very personally. The reason I don't think my sin is a big deal is because I don't think I'm a big deal. Right? I'm just me and I sin. And so my sin's not huge. I, if I lie or I do something in secret or whatever, that's just about me. But the Bible says ultimately every single sin on the planet is about God and God is infinitely glorious. And so there's no such thing as small sin. Every sin is high treason because you serve an infinitely glorious God. Okay, so sin is serious, and so I want you to see that Jesus is going to tell us a couple of implications of that idea here when he says sin is serious. And the first implication for you and for me is that we must cause no one to stumble. Now watch what he says. Let's start there. Verse, chapter 9, verse 42, he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. This is shocking imagery, and this whole passage is filled with shocking imagery. So, so, so he says, whoever causes, the cause of someone to sin, what's that word sin? The word sin there is actually the Greek word, and I tell you this because you'll hear something in English here, scandalizo, okay? We get our word scandalized from it. We just borrowed that from the Greek. Whoever scandalizes one of these little ones. In other words, Jesus says we must not be the cause of somebody else falling. And specifically, little ones who believe in me. Now, who are these little ones? The little ones, well, we've already seen he, he brought a child to him, right? And he did that whole thing, um, and talking about who's the greatest. He brings a child and says, you've got to be like a child. And then, and then uh, um, you know, John comes in verse 38. And now he's talking about little ones again. Well, sh certainly there's the context. There's little ones around him. But when he says little ones who believe in me, he's not talking just about children. He's talking about somebody who is a disciple of Jesus. Somebody who says, I'm a follower. I go after him. So the warning here, when he says whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, the warning is, is against anyone who would be the cause of a disciple turning away from following Christ. Sinning, stumbling, turning away. And if you cause a disciple to do that, Jesus says, it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and you drop into the sea. Now, now what's that? Okay, there were two kinds, and maybe more, but there were at least two kinds of millstones back in Jesus' day, and they were used for grinding wheat and grain, and there was a small household, uh, uh, you know, sort of our, our Cuisinart, right? I mean, it'd be our, it, it was a small household deal that a, that a wife or mother could, the, could use and grind out the wheat. I'm not being chauvinistic, that's just what mostly happened, okay? So the woman would be there, and she'd grind out, and she could do it with her hand. But there was another millstone that was sort of the industrial grade millstone. And this was actually called the donkey stone. And it was called a donkey stone because it took a beast of burden to get that thing to move and grind. That's the stone that Jesus is talking about. It's donkey stone. He says it would be better for you to have that thing fixed, you know, tied around your neck and you cast into a sea. In other words, the punishment that awaits uh, anybody who causes a little one who believes in Jesus to turn away would be more horrific than this terrible death by drowning. You're going mean, to notice the cadence of this whole passage, right? I, I mean, if this then do this because it would be better. If this, then do this because it would be better. Do this, then better, better, better. He's going to do this over and over. 
And he starts by talking about somebody like you and me who cause other people to sin, to stumble, to fall. Now, what does that look like? Well, maybe it looks like verses 38 to 41. So maybe he's talking to his disciples in that direct context to say, guys, don't stop somebody who loves me, who's trying to serve me. Don't walk and say, no, 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 you don't do that. Like you're going to cause them to fall and walk away from me because you're my representatives. Don't do that. But certainly there's broader application for us. Like the ways that my sinful behavior can, can, can have a corrupting influence in some other Christian, some other disciple's life. The way that we give permission for others to turn away and act sinfully because we're sinning. See, because look, you don't live on an island. Right? You don't live alone. You're not free to do whatever you want. People are watching you. And, and your life is, is doing one of two things. Your life, you're not neutral. Your life is either influencing people toward Christ or influencing them away from Christ. Which is it? Are you living a life that pulls and brings people closer or pushes them farther from Christ? Just says, you, you don't want to be the latter. So you know what? It matters what you do. It matters where you go. It matters what you look at. It matters what you do on Friday night when everybody else goes out to party, when you get drunk and somebody looks at you and goes, oh, well, they're a Christian. They get drunk. I can do it too. No big deal. Jesus would say to you, if you lead somebody else to do that, woe to you. Better for you to have a millstone. You're causing them to stumble. Parents, how about the, the little ones in your home? Like, you know, I've told parents before, I can give you the recipe for the quickest way to screw up your kid. It's just be something different on Sunday than you are Monday through Saturday. Hypocrisy will jack your kids up so fast because they'll go, that's, what's dad doing? He's raising his arms and acting like he's Mr. Spiritual when he comes home, and it's nothing like that. They will run from that God that you serve every time. You are causing your little ones to turn away. Guys, have you ever thought that every time you convince your girlfriend, your fiance, to jump in bed with you and you're not married it's okay we're both believers whatever, you, whatever excuse you use I love you baby he doesn't love you baby that you're causing her to stumble and she's a little one I'm not saying that's women I'm saying a, a woman can do the same thing to a man you're causing a little one to stumble you're leading them into sin and you hold yourself out as a Christian. You come to church, you play the part and you belittle the glory of God when you do that. Or Christian, what about the ways that you downplay certain sins and act if it's, it's okay because, hey, we're all Christians. I remember this during my, you know, youth days and Christian college days, right? You, you get to go out and do things that you wouldn't otherwise do because, hey, we're all doing it together. We're all Christians. Well, well then all, you're, you're all having this negative influence and causing each other to stumble. And we think that things like holiness is old-fashioned, right? When you say holiness, Chris, what that means is, you know, women have to wear their hair in a bun and wear culottes and no makeup and no, don't play cards and don't dance together. That's legalism. That's not holiness. The Bible demands holiness. It hates legalism. And holiness is something where you go, I want to be like Jesus, and I won't do anything. And what do we do? Well, hey, I'm just being myself. Whatever. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to sacrifice that for them. Yes, you should have to. Because you're a Christian and you lay down your life all the time. And say no to things. 
And maybe one of the ones that makes me just get most angry is teachers, and I'm talking about higher education now mostly, who feel like it's their job to undermine the faith of believers in Jesus. They take it as this mission, right? And this happens in secular institutions and it happens in faith-based institutions. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it happens in secular books and it happens in Christian books. And they think it's their mission to punch holes in your faith until you're like spiritual Swiss cheese and I'm just shot through. Listen, there is a fine line between, between the professor who says, I want to help these students grow up spiritually and intellectually in their faith. I want to mature their faith. And so I'm going to delve into some things. And I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to push against them. And we're going to wrestle through this together. And we're going to merge out of this. There's a fine line between that and, and so deconstructing a person's faith and never building it up again where they're like, I don't even know what I believe anymore. That is not kindness. And it's all done under the guise of just want to get you asked hard questions, right? Just academic freedom. Trying to be helpful. I want to cuss right now, right? I'm like, no, you don't. You're doing it to undermine their faith. And that is not kind, and that's not good, and that's not helpful. And you are causing someone, a little one of Jesus, to stumble. And we go on and on, right? People who persecute, hurt Christians, come after them, and it causes them, it's so great that they run from their faith and they can't take it. And Jesus says, woe to you. It would be better for you to have a death by drowning than for you to cause them to sin. Sin is serious. The sins that you do that cause someone else to stumble, to fall, to sin. And so you have to, we have to watch our lives carefully as parents, as husbands, as wives, as boyfriends, as girlfriends, as friends, as colleagues, as leaders. And we better ask ourselves, am I causing anyone to stumble? And if I am, I better repent and I better make it right with them. Some of you parents need to go home today. You need to say sorry to your kids. I've caused you to stumble. You've just followed my example. Please forgive me. Some of you boyfriends need to go to your girlfriend today and say, we need to break this off. But I'm causing you to stumble. I'm leading you into the bedroom. And Jesus says, woe to you. you would be better to die a horrific death than do what you're doing. So he says, don't cause anybody to stumble. And that's outward focused. And then he turns the camera, if you will, back on you and says, and kill your own sin. Look at verses 43 to 48. We're gonna kind of recycle through this, but let's read it the first time. And if your hand caused you to sin, cut it off. Verse 45, if your foot caused you to sin, cut it off. Verse 47, if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out. This is because it's better. Now this is startling. This is shocking imagery. What is, what is going on? Does Jesus want us? Is like Origen took this very seriously and he castrated himself. Is that what Jesus wants? He wants us to go out and mutilate ourselves? Now, the Old Testament is very clear that masochism is never, ever something that pleases God. Okay? Cutting yourself, thinking that somehow you're, you're paying for your sins is not pleasing to God. And I don't say it to be judgmental towards you. If that's you and you cut yourself, then listen, Jesus loves you. You don't have to do that. He doesn't want you to do that. See, it's just like when he says, look, it's better that a millstone be thrown around your neck. It's better that you enter eternity without hands, without feet, without eyes than to go to hell with both eyes and both hands and both feet. It's better. 
So, so I think what he's saying is this. He's saying this is how radical you must be with your own sin. Because it's no small matter. You, you must not allow anything anything to come between you and eternal life, to come between you and your relationship with Jesus. You have got to be ruthless with your sin. John Owen, famous Puritan, said this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. You hear what he says? There's no spiritual Switzerland, right? You're not in neutral territory. You are either actively seeking to kill your sin or it is actively killing you. Your life is a war. And there is nothing, here's what Jesus is saying, there's nothing worth doing, that's your hands. There's nowhere worth going, that's your feet. There's nothing worth seeing, that's your eyes, that is worth forfeiting eternal life and going to hell. So where, where, what are you doing? Where are you going? What are you looking at? It's not worth it. See, here's what Jesus is going to say. This is how radical. He's going to say later on in the book of Mark that if possessions get in your way, reject them, turn away from them. He doesn't say that to everybody, but he says, look, if they're a stumbling block and they get in the way between you and your relationship with Jesus and you can't put Jesus first, you must reject possessions. He goes so far. He has the audacity to say, if your family stands in the way, your blood relatives, your mom and dad, your children, if they stand in the way, your allegiance is first, foremost, always to Christ. You don't let anything stand. You obey Christ above everyone. He's going to say, man, you, to the point that it looks like, wow, you love Jesus so much, it's almost like you hate your parents. And you understand he's using hyperbole, right? He's, he's, he's being, he's trying to make this huge in your eyes. So he says, cut off your hands, cut off your feet, gouge out your eyes. Now, why would anyone in their right mind do that? That, that seems insane. Or is it? Does anybody know, heard the name, probably don't remember her name, Amy Copeland? She's been in the news lately. She's a gal in Georgia, 24-year-old grad student. She, uh, she's on a homemade zip line. The zip line breaks. It gashes her thigh. She goes to the hospital. The doctor's like, okay, they clean it out. They staple her up. She comes back. A few days later, it is swollen and oozing. And they're like, oh my gosh. They look at it. They give her some more medication. They do some tests. And they find out she has something called necrotizing fasciitis. For us lay people, that means flesh-eating bacteria. And it is racing through her body. To the point, there's a point in her recovery where she has to speak out. You know, she can't even talk. She's got the trach going. She's trying to communicate these ways. She's mostly unconscious. And by the end of it, she had a, I think she had a news conference last week. And she, she was at that new news conference. And she had no left leg. She had no right foot. And both of her hands were gone. Why would anybody do that? Well, you don't just do that, do you? You do that because it's life or death. You do that because if you don't do it, the flesh-eating bacteria will kill you. And so you look and go, how radical are we willing to be? We're, we're willing to be radical enough to save her life. You know, who was the hiker? They did a movie about him a few years ago and, you know, stuck in the canyon. Why would he cut off his arm? Because he didn't want people finding a skeleton, right? It was that radical. I have to do something. This is life or death. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. This is life or death. This is not a joke. And the only reason you will get this radical and cut off your hand as it were, or cut off your foot, or gouge out your eyes, is that you see that sin will kill you. It will destroy you. And the only reason you will deal this radically with your sin is that you see that it's leading me down a path of destruction and I'll die. Anybody, anybody... Remember the, uh, the Ken Burns series on the Civil War, that seven-part series? You can raise your hand. I'm a nerd. I love documentaries. Um, 
you should watch it. But there's this one point, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but there's, I think it's after the war ends and he's kind of showing these, this montage of pictures that he always does, but there's one picture that he, that he pans past and there's these men standing or sitting there and, 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 and it's like, you know, one guy's missing an arm, another guy's missing both arms, one guy's missing a leg and an arm and both legs and both, I mean, all these, amp- it's, just, it's just, just, this picture's filled with amputees. Why are they missing arms and legs? Because they were in a war and that was the cost of fighting a deadly enemy. And here's the deal. There are far too many Christians in our churches who are going to hell with two good legs, two good arms, and two good eyes. There should be far more spiritual amputees limping around this place. Because they look and say, man, this is killing me. So let me ask you the question. What do you need to chop off, cut out, gouge out? I mean, how radical are you going to get in your fight against sin? See, how many of you are willing to go, I'm, that's it. I, I'm throwing my computer in the trash. I'm getting rid of my TV. I'm severing the internet connection. I'm getting rid of my cell phone. I'm getting rid of cable. Netflix is gone, whatever it is. And you say, well, Chris, that's not realistic. I mean, I got to have the internet. Well, neither is cutting off your hand. It's not about being realistic. It's about being radical with something that's killing you. I mean, how many of you are dealing to, willing to deal radically with, I mean, you look at your life and you're like, you know what? I got the freedom to drink alcohol. And you look and you look at your life and you're like, but this alcohol is causing me to sin and it's leading other people to sin right along with me. Are you willing? Oh, well, hey, you know, it's a freedom. How many of you have an addiction that you look at it and say, man, I got a, this addiction, I mean, it could be as simple as cigarettes, stupid as video games, as crazy as drugs. And your addiction is killing you and drawing others in. See, what, what do you, are you, are you willing to walk away from a relationship? Some of you in relationships, you should not be in. And you know this. And it's not honoring to God. Maybe it's, you know, you're a Christian and the other person is not. Oh, but we get along so well and it seems so right. Well, who cares? You're disobeying scripture. And you know you shouldn't be doing that. How radical are you willing to get, right? You know you're not glorifying God. And some are going to object to, yeah, but you know, that doesn't get to the heart of the matter, Chris. And you always talk about heart. It's not about legalistic things. It's about your heart. And so if my heart's not engaged and I, you know, smash my computer, but you know, I still have a bad heart. Well, that, well look, <laughs> that's a cop-out. Because here's what I would say to that. I think the fact that you're willing to smash your computer and sever the cord and say, I got to borrow a friend's computer because I don't trust myself alone and I can't be alone with my girlfriend anymore, whatever. When you're willing to be that radical, that's evidence that God is already at work in your heart. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. See, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to quit your job because there's somebody in the next cubicle or next office or somebody you work with and man, you guys are flirting and you're a married man or you're a married woman and you keep pursuing that and you keep giving each other the eyes and you know, you stay there, you know where it's going. How radical will you be? So Jesus says, man, sin is serious. Now, why is it so serious, though? Because it seems like it's just me. Right? It just seems like, you know, all right, I didn't talk very nicely to Michelle. You know, or I did this, or I lied about something. Well, it's serious for all the reasons we've talked about, but then he tells us, I mean, something very frightening. He says, sin is serious because hell is real. Hell is real. Last year, a pastor up in Michigan, his name's Rob Bell, wrote a book. Many of you know what it is. It's called Love Wins. 
I read the book. It's a pretty quick read. Rob Bell essentially redefines hell as it's been defined by the Bible and orthodoxy for 2,000 years, and, and he defines it not as a place of eternal wrath or torment, but as, the, as, as, as you know, hell is, is the sad suffering of this life. It's that woman who's forced into prostitution in India because she can't pay her debts or whatever. And, and listen, nobody's going to argue with that. That's horrible. That's awful. But he's going to say, that's hell. Hell, hell doesn't last forever. It's actually kind of, con- right, I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit hard to know what Rob Bell actually thinks about hell. I mean, you'll say it's just a period of pruning. It's, it's a time where, where in, in Rob Bell's hell, hell is sort of sweet mates with heaven, and, you know, you're over in the hell suite, and, and ultimately God works in your heart, and you finally repent of your sins, so eventually hell's going to be empty because ultimately love wins. And everybody walks to the bathroom and gets into, hell, into heaven, right? The new suite. Now, one of the reasons that they do that, people want to talk like that, is because the more you, the more you look into the idea of hell, the more repulsive it becomes. It's a whole, listen, I didn't get up and go, woohoo, we get to talk about hell today. It, it's not, this is not, it's not a doctrine that we necessarily rejoice in in itself. What we rejoice in is the glory of God. And hell is, if every action has an equal and opposite reaction, hell is the echo of the glory of God. As John Piper says, hell is the equal and opposite reaction for you and me failing to glorify God. That's how sin is so serious. Francis Chan sort of wrote a response in a book called Erasing Hell. And he sort of describes our modern revulsion with the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of hell. He says this, I often hear people say, I could never love a God who would fill in the blank. And then he says this, who would what? Who would disagree with you? and do things you would never do, who would allow bad things to happen to people, who would be more concerned with his own glory than your feelings, who would send people to hell? Can't believe in that God? I I was listening to something this week. This guy was giving these statistics and he was talking about how how 82% of unchurched, okay, not you folk, unchurched people believe in a literal heaven. Right? I bet it's, you know, it's got to be in the way high 90s in the church, right? We live in a literal heaven. The number drops to 67% when you ask them, do you believe in a literal hell? Now, still, that's two-thirds. That's a lot of people. But here's the interesting part. They just don't believe anybody goes there. I mean, no. There's an exclusive club that we're pretty clear is there, right? Hitler's there. Well, you know, like, hey, he's got to be there. He's got to be, right? <laughs> Al-Qaeda, I mean, whatever. They're really surprised when they wake up from the suicide bomb and, oh my gosh, and, um, I mean, you know, so we can, we can populate hell with a pretty small group of people. I, I've ne- Maybe you have, I've never, I I have yet to either conduct this funeral or go to this funeral where the guy stands up and goes, he's in hell. There's no question that guy didn't make it. <laughs> okay, right? What do, you, what do you hear? Well, we either dance around it or, or something like, you know, he was a good man. I mean, he beat his wife and got drunk on the weekends and looked at pornography, but he's a good man at bottom. Get through all the sludge and down there's some goodness. And I've told you this illustration before. It's like, it's like saying there's a, there's a pipe pumping sewage. Just it's all over the place. And going, oh, but at its source, it's a pure spring. That's not possible. Right? You get this? This is not possible. We don't talk like that. See, so what do we do? We take Jesus and we take the Bible and we throw out all the edgy stuff that doesn't mesh with our lifestyle personally, 
and we keep all the things that make us feel warm and fluffy and make us feel good about ourselves and we end up with a Jesus of our own making. And we've said it a hundred times during this series on Mark that when you do that, you end up with a, a Jesus who is powerless to help you, to change you, to transform you, to push against you. And you wind up with a Jesus that isn't with a, in a hundred miles of this book. Because he's just one you made up. I, I, I want to think of Jesus as this. I like to think of Jesus as that, right? We live in this individualized American culture where, gosh, you, you can individualize your hamburger, your car, whatever you want. So I can do that with Jesus, can't I? And so here's the thing. I'm not talking about hell today and sin and all that because, you know, again, I, I, I thought, well, I'd just like to talk about this. It's, it's because Jesus is the one who brings it up. And I want to be faithful to Scripture and I want to tell you what Scripture says. If you don't like the doctrine of hell, your beef isn't with me, it's with Jesus. Because in this passage alone, Jesus is going to use the word hell three times, 43, 45, 47. And he uses this word, it's an interesting word, when he describes hell, he's, he uses a, a, a word, Gehenna. Gehenna literally means ge, the valley of an henna, hinnom, the valley of Hinnom. If you go to Israel with us next year, you'll see this. It's on the outskirts, on the south and west sides of, of the city of Jerusalem. It's a valley, a deep ravine. And this valley has a sordid, sordid past in Israel's history. There came a point where they abandoned themselves so much to pagan worship that they would worship pagan gods down there. They would make sacrifices down there. And they stooped so low at one point in their history that they actually sacrificed sacrifice their live children on an altar of fire and burn them alive to the God, to the God Molech. Horrifying. King Josiah comes along, you read about him in Chronicles and Kings, and he comes along, he's like, enough of this. This is, this is horrible. We are stopping this. And so what he does is he desecrates this whole area by turning it into a garbage dump. And so you would throw everything into that garbage dump. You would throw human waste. You'd throw animal waste. You'd throw all the byproducts that you didn't want. All your trash, everything went to the outskirts of the city. It must have been horrible. I mean, imagine this. There would have been like flies and maggots everywhere. This is why Jesus says, where the worm does not die. They would burn their trash. Fires, the smell, the smoke of nasty burning trash and carcasses and all kinds of things. And so when Jesus wants us to imagine hell and what it's like, he uses this grotesque, shocking imagery of the Hinnom Valley. And so if I could summarize, and I could, we could, there's books written about this. If I could summarize for you essentially what the Bible says about hell, it would be in this one sentence. Hell is a place of unimaginable, eternal horror. Unimaginable and eternal, and it's horrific. See, so, so, so look at Mark 42, okay? Let's listen to the cadence again. You cause one of these little ones to stumble, it'd be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck. If your eye, hand caused you to sing, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye and with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. You know what Jesus just said? It's better. It would better be better for me to never be able to touch my wife with my hands and rub my, my fingers through her hair and hold my children in my arms than for me to go to hell and have two hands that were able to do that. It would be better for me never to have known the joy of running through a meadow and feeling the grass between my feet than it would for me to go to hell with two feet that felt all of that. It would be better for me to never have seen my children, never have seen the Grand Canyon, never have seen a thing of beauty than to see and do all of those things and find myself ultimately in hell. Jesus says... That the horrible injury, right? Horrible injury, terrifying death 
is better than being thrown into hell. There's nothing that compares with it. So, so, so hell is worse than anything I can imagine. It's worse than stupid things like I, didn't, I lost my job. It's worse than I didn't get promoted. It's worse than not having sex with that person that you're lusting after right now. It's worse than not being popular. It's worse than not hanging on to that relationship that you know is not glorifying God. It's worse than having to sacrifice some of the pleasures of this life. It is going to be worse than sacrificing to stay married even when you don't want to. It's going to be worse than being hated by other people. It's going to be worse than you being persecuted and it will be far, far worse than you being killed because you believe in Jesus. And it lasts forever. I mean, this is why Jesus, we read there in verse 48, where the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. What does that mean? It's eternal. It goes on forever and ever and ever. Listen, no one no one has ever overstated the horror of hell. You can't. It's a place of unquenchable fire, verses 43 and 48. It's a place where the worm does not die, verse 48. It's a place of eternal fire, Matthew 25, 41. It's a place, it's called the hell of fire, Matthew 18, 9. It's a place of eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. It's a place of anguish in the flame, Luke 16, 24. It's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 8, 12. And listen to what Jesus says in, in Matthew 26, 24. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. You know the one who betrayed him? And, and, and this is what he says. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Now, let me just sidestep and just talk to you just for a second. There's some people that say, well, heaven, you know, it's this blissful existence. We're going to be up there and, you know, our bodies united with our souls and we'll enjoy that forever. But if you are consigned to hell, then what will happen to you is you will be annihilated. No consciousness, nothing. So for them, Hitler is going to be told, for all the Jews that you killed, for all the families that you separated, for all the horror that you caused on the earth, for all of that you'll feel nothing. Okay, how many of you felt anything consciously before you were born? Any of you remember your pre-born state? And if you do, you probably remember in something like, you know, in reincarnation, right? But n nobody. N nobody knows. You felt nothing. And Jesus says, he didn't say, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It'll be like before he was born. He'll feel nothing. He said, no, no, no. It would be better that he was not born because the horror that awaits him is terrifying. He says, uh, the, the Bible says in Jude, in, or Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, it's called eternal judgment. Jude calls it, listen to this, the nether gloom of darkness that has been reserved for the wicked forever. Jude 13. And maybe the most terrifying image of all is Revelation 14.11. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. This is not ACDC's highway to hell where we're going to go down, party time, right? No stop signs, no speed limits, nobody's going to slow us down. No, this is a place, that is not the hell that Jesus describes. The hell of Jesus is a hell of weeping and gnashing. Now when I say the word weeping, you can picture it, can't you? You know what weeping looks like, right? You, you, most of us go, I, I've seen it, I've seen it on TV, I've seen it somewhere, I've seen weeping. I bet nobody in here has ever seen something they would come back and describe, I saw gnashing of teeth. That's otherworldly. That's beyond what we've ever witnessed. That is a grinding of the teeth in anguish and hatred. I can't open my mouth. I am utterly undone by this thing. And it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. See, listen. 
the doctrine of hell is never in scripture as something that's just this abstract idea. Do you notice what Jesus does here? He wants to motivate us in this life by telling us about this horrific doctrine. It's never just like, hey, let me tell you about this place called hell. It's horrible. It's cut your hand off. Get radical with sin because hell is awful. Gouge out your eyes because it's horrible. He's going he's gonna to motivate Christians with this. Romans 12, he's going to say, hey, look, Christians, don't worry about getting vengeance on people. You can forgive, you can walk away because there's coming a day when vengeance will be taken and justice will be meted out and you will be avenged. And the sins against you and your own sins will be paid for. Every single one of them. They will either be paid for on the cross of Christ or forever in the pit of hell. Justice will be meted out. You don't have to worry about getting it. See, see the doctrine of hell, the fear of hell is a good and useful thing. I don't say that lightly. It's good that you fear hell. You, sh you should be repulsed by it. I mean, you should be repulsed by it. You're thinking, I don't want to be there, but you also should be, I don't want anybody else to be there. It is horrible because God's glory is infinite and it is the equal and opposite reaction to our failure to glorify God. So Jesus says, guys, this thing's real. Right? Hell is real, sin is serious, and it will take you there. How radical will you get with your sin, guys? This is not just a small matter. These are not just little sins. They have massive, massive implications. Holiness isn't a joke. It's a matter of eternal life or eternal hell. Now listen. Listen. That is a lot of bad news. But it's the bad news that makes the good news so glorious, right? Because the good news is that Jesus has conquered sin and hell for you. <laughs> like, like, listen... This is not a hopeless me message. If Jesus didn't want to save you from hell, you'd never hear this message. This is not about you ought to feel ashamed and run out of here. There's no hope for you. That's the whole point. There is hope. You can't save yourself. The Bible's going to tell you this in a million ways. You can't save yourself. Jesus can. Religion can't save you. Jesus can. You can walk out here and say, man, I'm not sleeping with my girlfriend anymore. That's not salvation. That's saying, I'm going to perform, and then Jesus will love me. No, you say, I, I need to fall in love with Jesus. Jesus transformed my heart, and now I won't do that. So what do you do? What do you do with this? Well, like everything. Look, if you're a believer in Jesus, when you discover that your life is out of alignment, when you discover that, man, I'm harboring some sins that I should not be holding on to, this is serious, and I'm not getting radical enough, and you discover I'm leading my children, or I'm leading other people to sin right along with me, and I'm acting like it's no big deal or whatever, then when you discover that, and the Holy Spirit pricks your heart, then what you do is you turn around, right? So you go, man, I'm going this way, and God's back there, and you turn around and you face Jesus and you run back toward him. What, is, what do we call that? Repentance. And we have made repentance into this word that beats people up. We've made it into this horrible word that's this downer, like you just got to walk around going, I suck, I'm a sinner, I'm terrible. That is not repentance. Repentance is I'm going this way. The cliff is there. I'm going to fall off, turn around, and I see the smiling, laughing, you know, face of Jesus, his nail-pierced hand saying, come, run. I got you. I'll take you. And you go, yes, I don't have to go over the cliff. There's an alternative. I can turn around. That's a hope-filled word. 
And it's the same for somebody who's not a believer in Jesus. You're, you don't know Jesus Christ and you know, you're not religious or you are whatever, but you don't have this relationship with Jesus. Look, it's the same thing. You turn around, you realize I am on a course of destruction. This flesh-eating bacteria is going to kill me. My arm is wedged between a rock and a hard place in a cave, and I'm going to be a skeleton unless I cut off my arm and I do something and I run to Jesus. You're causing somebody else to sin, and you're going, I'm not being radical enough with sin. I'm headed toward hell, and Jesus doesn't say, he's not laughing, going, ha, 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 yes, you are. He's standing over there going, come on, buddy, turn, look at me, walk toward me. I love you. I can forgive you. I can cleanse you. You feel dirty from sin. You don't have to feel that way. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I will transform your life. I will deliver you from the kingdom of hell into the kingdom, into my kingdom, into heaven. I'll do that. I, I, you don't have to go to hell. You can escape the coming wrath. He says, all you do, Mark 1.14, repent and believe the gospel. That's it. All you got to do is turn around. Turn around and say, I believe. I believe that what Jesus Christ did for me, that's going to save me. I believe that the cross paid for my sins and either I will spend an eternity paying for my own sins or I will fly to Jesus and say, I, you pay for them. Pay for them. You've already done it. And I cling to that. And he'll save you. You don't have to go to hell because Christ can deliver you. Let's pray.